We're going through the book of 2 Timothy, starting in chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. Paul was sent to proclaim the true grace of God in Jesus Christ, along with its terms and conditions. Verses 2 and 3. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Paul served God in line with how he has made himself known in the Jewish scriptures. The Jewish scriptures promised and foreshadowed the Messiah's first coming to purchase redemption, along with his second coming, wherein he will deliver his faithful subjects to eternal life in his presence and destroy those at enmity with his kingdom in the lake of fire, which is the second death. Verses 4 and 5, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned, or genuine, or authentic faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. The apostolic mindset is clearly that a person's claim to having an authentic faith in Jesus Christ does not make that so. Verse 6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance, that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee, by the putting on or laying on of my hands. There was obviously some added ability given to Timothy when he was ordained by Paul to oversee the church at Ephesus. Paul, Timothy had already proven himself faithful in many things by that point. God can and does enable the faithful to handle, to handle harder and previously unknown responsibilities as they come. But the unfaithful are not qualified for spiritual gifts, nor spiritual empowerment from God. Often, especially in charismatic and Pentecostal circles, the leaders will go around laying hands on anyone for spirit to, give them, to supposedly give them spiritual gifts and empowerment. They'll do this to anyone who cooperates with their show. They thus prove that the Holy Spirit of the true God is not the spirit that they are ministering. Consider the need to add fuel to a fire, and considering what it means to stir up the gift of God. Yet there is also such a thing as strange fire, which man produces to counterfeit the fire of the Holy Spirit. Such a fire rivals the Holy Spirit, and should indeed be extinguished. See our message on the curse of emotionalism for helping, for helping diagnosing such strange fire. Verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. The Holy Spirit is actually called the spirit of the fear of the Lord in Isaiah 11, 2. In the middle of a passage which corresponds closely to this verse, Paul is speaking here about how the Holy Spirit delivers those who commit their way to the Lord from the fear of man, and the fear of potential negative consequences of doing what is right in God's eyes. Verse 8, but be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God. And as passages like Acts 14.22 and John 16.33 make clear, tribulation in the world inevitably comes to those who are faithful to Christ. Many think they've experienced tribulation of this nature, who don't know it like they ought to know it. Yet many might indeed know it very well, if they only stood against the unbiblical concepts and the tolerated sin in the church which, which they are currently a part of. Verse 9, Who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, or before time began. Saved us is referring to either Paul and Timothy, or to all with authentic faith in Jesus Christ like they have. They were thereby in God's grace and no longer slaves to sin's guilt and power. Their ultimate salvation was not complete and not guaranteed, though. No one's is in this life. Remember how Paul had exhorted Timothy in the previous epistle to lay hold of eternal life, and how he instructed him how to prepare the Christians he oversaw to lay hold of eternal life. God planned that Christ would come to this fallen world in the flesh and die as a sin offering before the world began. No person earns the grace he offers in any way by their works. Receiving that grace and walking in it nevertheless has conditions which are unpalatable to the flesh of, of all people. 
those conditions call for works fit for repentance and submission to God's holy commandments and ways which are expressed in his word. As we deal with an average study, since there is no book of the Bible which fails to talk about this, nor is there any true, true Bible concept which isn't related to this. This all leaves each of us with nothing to boast of before God, and leaves us with nothing in our ways which we can rightfully keep back from the cross of Christ without um, forfeiting the eternal life he offers us. Verses 10 and 11. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. A fitting cross-reference here is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 4-7, to which was covered in our last study on, on 1 Timothy. Verse 12, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day, or until that day. God's purpose and grace in Christ Jesus, which has been offered to man and now fully revealed, is what Paul is re referring to, to here. Receiving that grace and walking therein will result in suffering for doing so. Continuing therein necessarily means enduring suffering and righteousness, and not turning from the Lord therein. Yet God has proven himself faithful. The last day when all is brought to light, all are brought to account, and eternal, and eternal consequences are measured out, will prove that suffering and faithfulness to God's word was not in vain, and well worth it for those who did so, and endured to the end of their Christian race. Verse 13. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Sound here is a reference to hygiene. The Greek word is hu di aino, where we get our word for hygiene, as wholesome is translated in 1 Timothy 6, 3. This is talking about retaining sound doctrine and not failing to live in accordance with sound doctrine. Later in the epistle in 2 Timothy 3, 5, where Paul warns Timothy about the perilous times will come, and how they will be perilous, because there will be many who have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. In that passage, Paul is using a different word in the Greek than the word translated as form here. In 2 Timothy 3, 5, Paul is speaking of those with, with an external practice of religion that is called Christianity, who are yet heathens at heart, and proved to be so by their character and deeds when their lives are overall examined biblically. Verse 14. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in us. Going back to verse 6, the fire of the Holy Spirit will be extinguished in an individual eventually, if not stirred up. Verse 15, This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from thee, of whom are phagellus and whom and whom agendus. Some turn away from the Lord. This is not only a grief for those who stay faithful, but it can also leave them hanging in difficult and or complicated circumstances when the companionship and assistance of those who turned away would have especially helped. The negative effects of their turning back from the Lord can also increase the difficulty and or complication of the circumstances of the faithful. Verses 16 to 18. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he after often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently, and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day, and in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, where Timothy currently is, thou knowest very well. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. Consider the mindset of a true apostle of Christ regarding obtaining mercy on judgment day. We really need to identify with the Lord in taking his side in everything, where his authority is an issue, and we really can't neglect supporting any cause or person that he would consider his own. What does this prayer for Onesiphorus to obtain mercy on Judgment Day say about the danger and the doom of those who do not lay down their life for the sake of walking in the truth of God's word and for the sake of Christ's people in the same manner that Onesiphorus did? Reference here the sheep and the goats in Matthew chapter 25 verses 31 to 46. And in regard to the everlasting punishment that the wicked will go into, even many who call Jesus Lord 
which Jesus spoke of in Matthew 25, 46. We have a cross-reference to that and a foreshadowing of that at the time that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis. This is also a cross-reference of 2 Timothy 1.18 in relation to the glimpse, the glimpse of the distinct persons within the Trinity, which each passage gives in very similar words. Genesis chapter 19, verses 24 and 25. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire, from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities, and that which grew upon the ground.